working here. And let's start with a word of prayer and we'll get into our Christian at ease, preceded with some Bible verses. Let's pray. Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to assemble together so that we can study your word and to get grounded in Bible doctrine. We know how important this is as believers in Christ. We know that Jesus himself said, man shall not live by food alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so, Father, we take this seriously. We do believe that there is a message in what Jesus said there as he was facing his adversary. And so, Father, it is in our best interest and it's to our benefit that we would live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God in its proper context, understood in light of what the word says. And so, Father, as we look into your word and as we study the various doctrines over time, I pray that you would give me the illumination and you would give me the wisdom needed to be able to delve into the word, not only in the English text, but as well as in the original text, so that I would handle it accurately, so that those who are studying with me would get something that's accurate and not something that is watered down or even mishandled as a result of poor spending time in the word. So, Father, I take this seriously, and I pray for those who are a part of this study that you would help me and us realize the importance of executing this in our personal lives so that ultimately you would be honored by everything we say, think, and do. So, Father, before we proceed, we'll just take a moment of silence with our heads bowed and confess any known sins, if we have any, and then we'll proceed with the study. Lord, forgive me for checking on your sins. There's no stop. Father, God, thank you. We thank you, Father, for this time. And so as we engage in your word, I trust that it's God, the Holy Spirit, who is going to help us see these truths as we look at them closely and with the brothers and sisters in Christ together. We ask and pray these things in Christ's matchless name. Amen. Okay, let's take a look at the very first verse here, because you'll sometimes hear me say, Hello, royal family of God. And so I wanted to anchor that in the passage of scripture that shows where it says that. So if you look here in the front, 1 Peter 2, uh, 9 and 10 highlights this very fact. But I'm going to make some adjustments here so that we can understand why it says what it says. So you are a chosen generation, referring to us, the believers in Christ, of course, starting 2,000 years ago, a royal priesthood. So here we are. We're a priest. We're royal. So I'll sometimes say, good evening, royal family of God, because you and I are a priest before God. So we don't have to go through a priest anymore because you are one, whether you know it or not. At the moment of faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, you have been called, you have been made into a priest, meaning you go directly to God the Father now. You don't have to go through someone. You don't have to go through me and confess your sins or repent. You go directly to the Father. And that was one of the primary reasons why we don't go to a priest we don't go to any individual because you are one and that's important to know so first peter chapter 2 verse 9 calls those post acts 2 post acts chapter 2 after we become believers in christ we are now part of what's called the church age or the age of grace or sometimes also known as the age of the holy spirit so acts chapter 2 is a pivotal point in where we become indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit, and actually God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. But we learn these truths from the book of Acts or the book of Romans on, which is why I tend to focus on the New Testament, particularly from Gospels on. And then with the, um, I would also include portions of the epistles, um, with the Gospels, if I'm teaching from the Gospels, say the book of John or so, so on. But it's important for us to see that when we study the Bible, it's done in a very particular way. 
And so I'm very clear. I'm, I try my best to be very clear and making the distinctions where necessary. So for example, it's very important for us to know where the Old Testament system stops, like in the gospel accounts, you can see that it's still in, in order. It's still in effect. Remember, they talk about the tithing, for example. That's an Old Testament rule. That's an Old Testament principle. Believe it or not, the church age is not under the, the tithing principle. That was for Israel. It's not even for us. Did you know that? You're technically, mm -hmm. we're not called to tithe. What the churches are supposed to do is give out of a gracious heart. Um, we call this grace giving or an offering because tithing, although not for us today, it's a good starting point where it talks about 10%, but really that's not a principle for the church age believers because we're what? A royal priest. So, and there's much more to it. I'm not going to be able to cover every single thing at the moment, but this is why it's important to have someone who knows collectively what certain truths are, because if you're just combing through a book, if you're reading a book about, a, about the book of the Bible, you're not going to be able to get these nuances. And I'm going to show you something else in just a moment as well. But please know that we are a chosen generation. That's us now. We're called a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Now, here's what I wanted to inject. We're not his people in the sense of the technical term in the Old Testament, where it refers to God's chosen people, because God's chosen people is Israel. We're his chosen priests. We're the bride of Christ. We're under the church age. And so we're a priesthood. And he, uh, Peter talks about a royal, a special people because we are special, special in the sense that we have been adopted into the family of God. We are now cleansed by the blood of Christ. We are infused and indwelt by God himself, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, therefore allowing us to be his spe special people. The only ones that were called to be Christian or Christ-like. Even Israel was not called to be Christ-like. They were told to ad advance the truth of God, but they dropped the ball eventually. In fact, they rejected their Messiah, which was Jesus Christ. So now the baton has been passed to the Gentiles, and now we have the special task and responsibility of advancing the cause of Christ because Israel failed. So now we're a chosen generation. He has chosen us chosen you and me, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, or really a holy people. And so you also get that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light, who once were not a people, we were losers, we were destined for the lake of fire, but now are people of God. So we represent him people of God in the sense that we're adopted into his family. What kind of people? A chosen generation kind of people, a kind of royal priesthood kind of people, and also his special people in the sense that we're the bride of Christ, we're the church of God. And so this all comes together when you understand how to intersect them all together. Very, very critical and crucial for understanding properly the word of God. Now, you'll notice that lately I've been talking about understanding the word of God properly. I say this not to, um, not to challenge your intelligence or to belittle you or anything like that, but to say this because at the latter days, as we're getting closer to the rapture of the church, there's gonna be an ongoing shift away from Bible doctrine, away from God's word. And they're gonna say things and wanna do things that'll tickle their own ears. They're gonna be very selective in what they wanna hear. They're not going to want to go through the Bible verse by verse, going contextually, going exegetically, because it's too hard. It, too, it takes too much, um, too much work to delve into it and say, oh, yeah, chosen people. Oh, I know what that means. But no, there's much more to it. And I'm going to show you in the next few slides why I'm saying what I'm saying. So we were once not a people, but now we're a people of God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. So we were merciless. Now we have mercy. 
We were a nobody. We were a loser destined for the lake of fire. Once who were dead, now alive. And we're a chosen generation. So he chose you and me. We're a royal priesthood before this unbelieving world. And so he has tasked us with a major, major responsibility. And I've been trying to exhort you all, me, myself included, to go out there and talk to people and find creative, way, creative ways to get the word out, even if it just means sharing a little bit. By the way, come to my church. By the way, come to our Bible studies. By the way, by the way, by the way, whatever you can do to make an impact so that they'll say, hey, that's interesting. I remember Jenny saying this. I remember um, Sarah saying this. I remember Crystal saying this and Connie saying this. Maybe I should check it out because I'm telling you, the way the world is now, people are open. People are sensitive. While they're watching all these people go into mass depression and trying to listen to Peter Jordan or Peterson, Jordan Peterson and trying to get wisdom from this guy, I think he's great. But if you don't have God, it's only surface solutions. We remember, remember, there's a sin issue that needs to be dealt with. And if it's only psychology and medicine, it's not going to hit the core of the sin issue. We have a sin nature. So does everybody else. <clears throat> and there is nothing, nothing at all that the world can offer to offset the sin issues in the person, the individual who is not regenerate, not born again. It has to be dealt with through the power of God himself. If we don't offer them a solution through regeneration, through birth, birth, through the birth, through believing in Christ, they're going to spin their heads in a circle. They're going to spiral downwards until they take their last breath. There is no other option unless they acquiesce to Jesus Christ. So now I want to show you this in the New King James Version. Wonder what. <coughs> Excuse me. For some reason it's just. Okay. This is a new NLT now. Same verse. And like I said, I tried to give you a simplified version because sometimes it's easier to understand when we look at it from a paraphrased version. So long as we keep in, in when we consider something a little bit more literal, like the New King James or even New American Standard. <clears throat> NLT says, but you are not like that. That for you are a chosen people, you are royal priests. All of you are a holy nation, a holy people, God's very own possession. You hear that? You belong to God. You are God's possession. So he's obligated to take care of you because you belong to him. When you have something um, that's of extreme value, do you not take care of it? Like a diamond ring or a gold necklace or something of value, don't you take care of it? Your wedding ring, your wedding band, do you not take extra care of that as opposed to just any other jewelry? So when it's a possession of great value and you are of great value, then he is going to take care of you. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's own very possession. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. This is now the NLT. The goodness of God for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people. Now, as a people, it's kind of like, um, let me just put this here real quick. I'm sure, make sure if you guys can uh, just temporarily mute your mics for now because it's giving me feedback. So it's kind of distracting if you don't mind. Um, let me see if I could do it here. Okay, there. Okay, so <clears throat> now going back to NLT, First uh, Peter 2 verse, 10 once you had no identity as a people you hear people who are racist today they you people you people you guys you filipinos you white people you and on and on and on right so now peter is saying you had no identity as a people 
But now you do. Now we do because we're a royal priesthood, right? Now you are God's people. So we are a people. What kind of people? God's people. Once you receive no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. That may not sound like a big deal, but if you think about it, especially down the road, you have been extended mercy. And if he did not extend mercy, you and I are headed for the flames of the lake of fire. Now, you, you would have, you'd have to sit there and think about the gravity of what you are avoiding now because of God's grace. You no longer are headed there because of his mercy. So sometimes I just go back and think about what I have been spared from, and it gets me ramped up to do even more. Because once you see the seriousness of that and what he did, he stepped in and took our place so that we didn't have to go there. It should never, ever get old. So I'm trying to use positive things to show you how valuable you are. Yes, you have problems. Yes, you have challenges. But those are temporal, okay? Eventually, those are going to vanish. We're going to be taken out of here. We're going to be face to face with the Lord, absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. We don't have to worry about this anymore. We're going to be in heavenly bliss. We'll be with each other for all eternity in front of God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. We won't have any problems at all. We won't have any health issues, nothing. It's all gone. No bills, nothing. We're going to be face to face with God. And the only other option is to be dead and headed for the lake of fire. Um, they're going to open the books and look at your works and you're, it's going to amount to nothing. And then you're going to be hurt. You're going to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. That's a frightening words that you're going to hear. But guess what? You're not going to ever, ever hear it because you're a son or a daughter of the most high. You're part of the royal family of God. So you had no identity as a people. Now you are God's people. Once you receive no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. So praise God, we have every reason to be bold when it comes to sharing our faith. Now I know that you guys may be, maybe English is a second language, so you stammer and stutter. I don't know how to say this, but you know what? I bet you, if you had to share something of great importance to your family member or friends, and there's something like, if you say this properly to them, you will have a million bucks, half a million bucks, you'll find a way. Believe me, I know that to be true. That's human nature. So the, the, the focus now is recognizing the impact of what this will do to the people that you know, if you don't share in English or whatever language you want to share. But if you don't make a stand for Christ, because basically, basically in essence, you are not wanting to stand for Christ if it's a language barrier. You don't want to stand for Christ or he's not worth it to you. And to me, I, I'm hoping that as you stick with me all this time, you're going to realize, hey, he keeps hitting on the same thing. It's kind of like salvation. Well, that's where it's at, everybody. It's all about salvation. If, if, I, if you hear me talk about salvation over and over and over, that's because that's a high priority to me. Because once a person dies, that's it. But I'm also showing you the flip side of who you are in Christ. Tuesday nights, we're learning about who are you, your fragrance, your um, light, your salt, your letter to the unbelieving world. So combined with this, we're seeing how we can relax. This study is about how we can relax amidst the problems. We have access to spiritual assets and doctrine that will help us orient to God's way of handling the stressors of life. Because he already knew, he already knew that we we're going to have difficulty in this world. He knew that because of sin, and he provided salvation one, two, and three, phase one, two, and three, for us. But if we don't want to study it so that we can see how to stabilize during hardship, that's really on us, because God has provided all the means of being able to walk through life, um, the shadows of death, the valley we should be able to walk through there with stability more than anybody else, okay? So that's Second Peter. I wanted to remind you that we are a royal priest. Now, having said that, I wanna show you something. Here's our favorite chart, my favorite chart, right? Phase one, phase two, and phase three. I wanna show you something before I show you the next slide because it'll tie together and you'll see what I mean. Look here. 
I don't know, on the top, bottom left, this is talking, I just wanna make sure we're clear on this. Um, for, for by grace, you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see the word saved there, right? So saved here is being born again. No big deal, right? We know this, good. How about this one here, phase two? How many salvations he are here? Let's see if I can enlarge this enough. <clears throat> but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse nine, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved through wrath, from wrath through him. How many save, how many times is the word saved used here in this verse here? The word saved is only mentioned once, right? The see that there on the near the corner or the bottom right? We shall be saved from wrath through him. But salvation in Romans 5, 8, and 9 is mentioned twice. I don't know if you saw that. Where, Pastor Freddie, does it say save twice? I don't see the word save there. Right. But this is why it's important to be able to be fluid and flexible with the word of God. You have to have the eyes and the experience to see this. Okay. Look at this. Right here on the bottom. Much more having now been what? justified by his blood what does it mean to be justified oh wait a minute according to my chart justification is phase one so it's actually mentioned twice here in one verse or two verses actually romans five eight and nine so you have for by God demonst but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So far, so good, right? Much more than now, having now been what? Justified. What's that mean? Phase one. What's that mean? We were saved. What's that mean? We are a Christian now. See that there on the left side? Now we have been a Christian. We have been justified also known as phase one, which means I have been saved from the penalty of sin. So when you go back to one verse or one passage with the two verses, it talks about salvation twice. So we've been justified by his blood, the death of Christ. We shall also be saved from wrath through him. The bottom of verse nine right there on the bottom there. See that? I'll see if I can enlarge it. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So the word saved is only mentioned once, but you have to have an eye to be able to notice. And wait a minute, he says we've been justified. So what does that mean? Paul is saying, because we have been saved by his death, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, now you have to unpack that. What does that actually mean? Well, I've, I've taken you through this in the past, so I'll not spend any more time on this, but I just wanted you to see this because this is very, very important, okay? Let me see something here. Very, very important. So now, having said that, let me show you why it's important for having someone who's been there and done this in the past, has gone through seminary, has been trained. Look at this word. <clears throat> taken from Galatians 5. This is the great Greek word sarx. This is the word sarx right there in the middle. You see that? Let's see if I can enlarge it a little. Sarx. Sigma alpha rho key. Sarx. So you've got this. What does that mean? It, has, it could mean an ordinary way, illness, flesh, human effort, sinful nature, man, no one, outwardly the that nature so depending on the context remember context 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 
Sarks can mean any of this. So now you have to spend the time and say, what does this actually refer to? Because the translations, the, the committee does their best that they can to, to translate this into English, but it could mean any of these. And so they have to sit there and think it through and then pass it through the committee and say, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And these are all uh, men who are well-studied and women too, who are a part of the translating committee and they sometimes don't agree. So they'll sit there and say, I think it means flesh in this context. Well, I think it means human effort in this context. And so what a good pastor will do is say, if he sees the word sarks, like in Galatians 5, the works of the flesh, you got to look contextually. Is it referring to sin nature or flesh? Sometimes sarks is referring to this. Sometimes sarks is referring to what's in here, the sin nature. So I have to go in there and at, give it my best and study it closely in context. So a few weeks ago, I said, sometimes just knowing the literal word doesn't make it easier. You have to have the rules of hermeneutics overlaying that to put it together and say, okay, it can't mean this because he's referring to this. It can't mean flesh because he's re referring to sin. So it has to be maybe the sin nature, not the flesh. So it, it's rigorous effort to go in and try to figure out what the text is saying. Because when you have an English text, uh, you have the Holman, you have the NIV, you have the New King James, you have the New American Standard, New, La New Living Translation, all these translations out there. They all have an advantage and purpose, but there's nothing better than seeing, for, seeing it for what it really says in the original text. And not only just seeing what it says, but to be able to see the nuances, the tenses behind the words. Is it a present tense? Is it an aorist tense? Is it, a, is it active voice, passive voice? Is it all these things that have to be considered when looking at one word, one word. And you've probably heard, for example, John, the disciple whom Jesus, what? Loved. Well, the English says loved, but you're not going to be able to get the full impact of that one verse unless you look at it, what it says, look at it in the original text. So without going into all that, I'd rather get into the study now because I know you're probably waiting for the study. We're just going on this so far. The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's what it says in the English, okay? But when you look at it in the original text, the tense of that verb is actually, it has the essence of the ongoing, the, the disciple whom Jesus kept on loving and loving and loving and loving. So it's not just the di disciple who Jesus loved. It's the disciple who Jesus kept on loving and kept on loving and loving and loving and loving. Now, why is that? Huh? That's for a future study. But that nuance is not going to ever, ever, ever come out in the NIV, New American, New American Standard, New King James. No English translation will render it that way because they don't. So sometimes for, to make it smooth, the translators just say the words in English as best as they can to make it smoothen out when it comes, rolls over to trend in English so that we don't have a difficult time trying to understand it. Another thing that I mentioned last week, for example, sometimes you'll see words in your Bible where it's um, italicized. You know what that means? It was never there in the original text. So if you find a word that's there and it's italicized, it's not there in the original text. They put it there so that the, the sentence will flow and it'll make better sense for those who are English speaking. So again, I'll close on this and then let's go into the study. Please look at the chart in front of you. So imagine having a Bible study. Now you have to go through and figure out, okay, how do I best render this word? Um, should it be human effort, sin nature, man, no one outwardly, they all make sense for they're all attached to this. There is a nuance and a semantic range is what it's called. 
semantic range for the word itself. So I have to look at the content. So it's not just looking at Christian at ease and say, okay, we're on. Let me read it beforehand and then give it. <clears throat> no, because sometimes even with uh, men who are well-studied and well-grounded, I will sometimes differ with them like RB theme. I've had some my moments where I've disagreed with him on certain translations. Now, does that mean I'm right and he's wrong? No, I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to say that I arrived at a different conclusion. And I even had this in one of our presentations at Church of Open Laguna Woods, where one person uh, rendered a particular passage a certain way. And I disagreed with him during his presentation, during his sermon. And I told him why um, I, I disagreed with him. And then I came up and followed it up with a discussion. I gave my arguments why I believed it was one this way. Went against theme and a host of other people. And I showed them why it came up to what, how I concluded. So that's just for FYI. That's the kind of study I do when I prepare for things like this. So just because we're reading a book together and I'm flashing the notes on the screen doesn't mean that I haven't read it beforehand and I've read the, ver the, the pages without first scrutinizing it. Even though I know he's solid, great teacher, I align with him for the most part, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to just um, flash it on the screen without first looking at it, being able to um, comment or teach on it because I always have to check the material before I even give it out, even if the guy is solid, because sometimes they have their bad days too, right? So having said that, let's now go to page 11. <clears throat> but we, we ended on page 12 last week, but let me again for just so we can follow the flow of the author, I'm going to take it from the page before, so it will make sense by the time we get to 12. So I'm going to start with first of all faith rest is continuous. It's habitual faith, which is often called perseverance, or patience Romans 12 12 patience does not imply that you just sit around doing nothing. Patience, as described in scripture, means to be steadfast in believing God's word. So as you're being patient and you're waiting for God's answer, you're steadfast in God's word. You're still stick, you're still um, toughing it out, gutting it out, going into his word, uh, faith resting. You're still focused on his word, understanding his word. It's, it's to exercise a tenacious faith that continues. Listen to this continues even when, when troubles persist. What does that mean? So even just because you're in the word of God, just because you're, you're able to recite a verse and pray doesn't mean that the problem will subside. Sometimes it will increase. You have to consider the adversary is also going to make life difficult for you. If he sees that you're going through hardship, he's going to get your family members to go against you, to talk about you and all these things, and it's just going to make things difficult for you because you're now having a hard time. And so he's going to try to get you to goof up. That's his goal. His goal is to deceive. His goal is to make it difficult for you and for me. And if you think about this, when you look at Matthew 4, for example, we don't have to go there, but just hear what I have to say. And then you can check for yourself. In Matthew 4, Jesus was led to the mountains, right? To be tested by the devil. He was led by the spirit of God to be tempted for 40 days, 40 nights. He was fasting beforehand, but he did well, so much so that his father in heaven, the clouds opened up. This is my son whom I, whom, who I'm well pleased with, right? You remember that? So what happens next? He's taken up to the mountains by the spirit of God. And guess what? He now goes from being bringing honor to his father and now getting hit hard by the adversary. What's my point? Well, now that you know that that's possible, so if you're putting, you're, you're putting your foot down at advancing the cause of Christ, doing your best to serve him with everything that you've got, regardless of how you feel at the moment, regardless of your energy levels, regardless of everyone making fun of you or talking, you still doing that? You still doing this? God is dead. Inspe instead of uh, caving in to the circumstances, 
whether it's people, friends, or family, you sit there and remain steadfast, you might get hit hard. Because as, we, as I mentioned, Jesus was pleasing the Father. He was baptized. Let all things be done so that be, um, I can remember the exact words, that it will be fulfilled, I believe. And then this is my son who I'm, who I'm well pleased with. And the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And then the next scene, he's taken into the wilderness to be tempted. So if you're doing something hard for God, if you're doing something and you get in God's pleased with your efforts, guess what? The devil is probably going to be around the corner. He's going to try to hit you in the belly so that you'll stop. But that's the time that you take it up to the Lord. Say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. Things are happening right away, 100 miles an hour. Uh, I'm a little discouraged, but Lord, I'm going to cast my cares upon you because you care. I'm going to faith rest. This is your battle. This is what we're looking at right now, right? So he says, patience as described means steadfast in believing God's word to exercise a tenacious faith that continues even when troubles, what? Persist. So even when the troubles are still coming at you, 100 miles an hour, you persist. You stay, remain steadfast in his word, regardless of what's going on, because you know God sees it all. And if he's allowing you to go through it, link that with another promise, God will not give you anything that you can't handle, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So if that's true, then that means you can handle a lot. You're about to give up, but guess what? God says, no, you're not. You're, you're fine. I'm not going to give you anything you can't handle. You're stronger than you know. So I'm going to allow this to happen because I'm wrestling with, with Satan right now. And I'm saying, go for Freddy. You can't stop him. Go ahead and try to attack him. Don't take his life, though. You almost did, but not in my watch. No way. Go ahead. Go for it. And he knows that I can only take so much. that he, So he's not going to give me something that I can't handle or something that Tess can't handle or something that Jenny can't handle because he knows our limitations. So that's the, that's the importance of knowing what doctrine has to say in the word. You should be able to correlate these together and say, ah, no, God says he won't give me anything I can't handle. Linked with Romans 8, 28, God will cause all things to work together for good. He's not going to give me anything I can't handle. And he's going to cause everything to work in the end anyways. 100, 100%, 110%, give it to God. This is all or nothing. You either give it 100% or nothing. Give him all your best. He says, this does not mean that you quit your job and become a bum. It means that you let God do your fighting for you. There's that fighting word again, right? He will fight for you. Who can stand against God? Imagine if you literally had to fight God. Would you win? Can you think of anybody in this world that can win over God? You think Mike Tyson can? Not even. The military forces of the world or combine of the world? Not even. Not even. So he says, let God do your fighting for you. You cease trying to solve your own problems apart from God's resources. One of the resources is Bible doctrine. We're seeing it over and over and over. And that's what I've been saying because I know this for a fact. It has to be rooted in Bible doctrine. And now that I've been trying to champion this and teach everybody consistently, regularly, so much so that people say, oh, yeah, you know, if, if I die, I want people to know that he was steadfast in Bible doctrine. That's what I want, would want to be known for, that this guy always focused on Bible doctrine because he believed it, he lived it, and he taught it. That's what I would want people to remember me for. So I'm not going out without a fight. I'm going out. I'm going to give it my best. And I would hope that you would as well. He goes on to say, let God do your fighting. You cease trying to solve your own problems apart from God's resources. You have a relaxed mental attitude, a peace of mind in the middle. Where? In the middle of everything that is happening around you. So even though there's a wall of problems and trials around you, you should have a relaxed mental attitude. Why? Well, if you think about it, you're a royal priest. You belong to him. All of heaven is watching what's taking place. And it's all promise that you're not going to be able to, you're not going to get 
anything that's going to overwhelm you because it's backed up by God's promise and decree that he would never give you anything that you can't handle, which means the sovereignty of God is consistently overseeing and watching your every steps and every detail that happens to you. In order for that promise to be a reality in your life, that means he has to be watching you so that when you're crying and you're angry and you're hitting a wall and you're angry and throwing your hands up, he sees that. And he says, Freddie, don't you remember? I'm not, give you, I'm not gonna give you anything you can't handle. So although you think like giving up, don't. I am gonna honor my word. If you just cast your cares upon me, watch, relax amidst all of this and watch whether or not I am consistent with my word. See if I'll honor my word. How many times have you let me down, Freddie? How many times have I let you down, Freddie? None. I have a good track record. You not so good. You keep confessing your sins and talking about 1 John 1, 9. Do I ever 1 John 1, 9? So you can count on me. Just relax because I'm in your corner. Relax, I'm in your corner. Crystal, Kathy, Tess, I'm in your corner. You don't think that I see what's going on? You don't think that I knew this in eternity past? And if I'm allowing this to happen, I'm, I'm allowing you to watch. I'm giving you first, first front row seats to watch how I'm going to execute my perfect will in your life. So relax. Don't stress out. I commanded you not to stress out. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything with prayer, supplication, don't forget, with thanksgiving. Why? Because I'm going to take care of you. I have the hardest job, and it's not too hard for me, by the way. I'm sovereign, God speaking. So have a peace of mind in the middle of everything is going on, bottom of 11, when every detail regarding creation was provided, the creator rested. <clears throat> not because he was tired. You can't tire God but because his work was completed. So he rested and he gave us an example. He goes on to say, okay. Thus, as a memorial to his grace provision, God declared a rest, bottom of 11, originating from the foundation of the world, Hebrews 4.3. This rest is perpetuated forever. It's an example for us forever till he comes and takes us out of here. Top of verse tw uh, page 12. God has already worked out all problems. Listen to this. God has already worked out all our problems, all problems, and now offers a solution for every dilemma. So do you have dilemmas? One, two, three dilemmas, four, five, 10, 20. He's worked it out already in eternity past. He assures rest to those who claim promises by faith. So you have to have at least on your end, your responsibility is to know his promises, which means you must know his word, that, which means you must study his word, which means you have to make sure you accurately study it, which involves getting under a pastor teacher who is fluid and is flexible with the word of God, can systematize it, pull it all together, look at the nuances, look at the original text, and be able to give it to you for what it says. Regardless of what a book of the Bible says, he can tell you on the fly, if need be, on the go, as we're studying the text together. See, the one who provided these promises is immutable. What's immutable? Immutable, unchanging, and true. He's immutable, unchanging, and true. Therefore, he is always faithful to his word. That's what I said earlier, right? Therefore, he is always faithful to keep his word. Lamentations 3, 21 to 24. Goes on to say, because he is also omni omnipotent, he is also, he is, he is able also to perform everything he has promised. So imagine, okay, he's got these promises and he's immutable to keep his, he keeps his word. And because he's omnipotent, that just means all powerful, top of 12, he is able also, because he's powerful, 
to perform everything he has promised. Can you execute every promise you give? Sometimes we can't. Sometimes things happen. You get sick. You get a little under the weather. So you promise you're going to help someone out over the weekend. You promise you're going to be there. You're going to meet with them for coffee or lunch or something, but you can't because you're under the weather. Your car broke down. It overheated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things happen, right? God, because of his sovereignty, because of who he is, because he's omnipotent, He's also able to perform everything he has promised, regardless of what happens in life, regardless of whether or not we keep our promise to him, he can keep his promise to us. It's not contingent on circumstances or us. Everything he promises is decreed and he says it will happen regardless of the individual he made the promise to or the people that he made the promise to, whether it's his church, whether it's Israel, he will keep his promise because of his omnipotence, because he's all powerful and he's not affected by circumstances at all. We are, but not him. The mechanics will vary. He will either deliver you. Remember this, this is what we, this is where we were last week and very important to understand this. So listen to this closely. The mechanics of the problems will always vary he will either deliver you out of the problem or he will sustain you through the problem. Let me repeat. The mechanics will vary. He will either deliver you out of the problem or sustain you through the problem that you may be able to endure it. So he's either going to remove the problem or he's going to sustain you through it. His words are, he will either deliver you out of the problem. I, I also include he'll take the problem away. He'll take that person away, the individual away. He'll take the problem out of the way, or as the author says, he'll deliver you out of the problem or sustain you through it. So what, whichever you prefer to use, they're both the same. They're almost saying the same thing. He will either deliver you out of the problem or <clears throat> sustain you through it. So... For me, sometimes God will take the problem out of there. You pray in Psalms, there's imprecatory prayers where the, the psalmist will pray for their en his enemies and God will sometimes e eradicate the enemy. So these imprecatory prayers um, talk about how you pray that God would squash the enemy, take the enemy out, and he would. So, but the author says, he'll either deliver you out of the problem, and I would like to include, he'll either take the problem out or he'll sustain you through it. So either way, he'll either sustain you through it, take you through it, or take the problem out. But the point is, is that God, only God can do either of those. And it's important to know that so that when we're getting slammed with problems, we'll recognize that we just have to be patient. We just have to be relaxed. He's still working his perfect will amidst us. All we have to do is relax. Our part is to relax so that we don't get sick. We don't have to worry because he promised that he'll take care of us, okay? A third characteristic of the faith rest technique is prayer. Every time you use a promise like 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety or care upon him because he cares for you, you are exercising faith rest. And that promise is claimed by prayer. So let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So in time of need is when we are going through hardship, when we're going through difficulty. Guess what? You will. Remember what it says in James? Count it all joy when you encounter trials. Uh, the various trials, they're forthcoming. So when you take in total what the word of God says, coupled with verses like this, uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, we know that God's got our back. He's in our corner. Does it always look like that or feel like that? Of course not. But that's why we don't go by feelings. We go by faith, not by sight. We operate by faith. Don't let the circumstances affect you get grounded in Bible doctrine and relax. God's on your side. Let me see, bottom of 12, 
these are the three steps. There are three steps in the faith rest. These steps form an effective drill to follow when you are so beset with difficulties that you cannot think clearly. Shock or pressure may cause your emotions to rise up and revolt within your soul, which is why we don't want to make decisions when we're angry or we're happy. If we're angry, we might say something or do something that we regret. If we're too happy, we may make a decision that is not even uh, prudent because we're just happy. You know, like I, I've given you the example before. One time I was so happy. It was, I was having an awesome day, a great day, and I get a knock on the door and these girls come over selling uh, Girl Scout cookies for an for a very expensive price, something out of the ordinary. I think it's like 10 bucks for a box or something like that, or maybe it was just a normal price. But I said, uh, I was having such a good day. I said, give me three. I'll take three. Really? Yeah, I'll give, take, give me three. I was having such a good time. And then of course, Corrine wasn't too happy about that, but I made the decision because why? I was so happy. I was having such a great day. I said, you know what? These girls are working hard. Give me three boxes. So uh, my point is, is that when I'm happy and when we're happy, we sometimes will make decisions that are not always prudent. So that's why if you drink in excess, you, your, um, your wisdom and your common sense drops. So you don't want to be around people when you're drinking too much. I mean, a little alcohol is okay, but you don't want to get drunk. The scripture is against drunk drunkenness. And so you don't want to be carried away by the alcohol. That's why Paul says, uh, be filled with this. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Don't be under the influence of wine, be under the influence of the spirit of God. That's what it means. So drinking on occasion, like wine or something like, or occasional, you know, alcohol is not a sin, what becomes a sin is when you are getting drunk. That's what the scripture calls a sin. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. So that's why it's important to see in context what the scripture is talking about. So now I'm going, this is where we'll stop, page 12. Page 12, I'm going to stop here. And I want to open it up for questions. So just in case any of you have some thoughts or comments on this because we had a number of things that were I think were positive so we have a pretty strong turnout tonight again so if you can just unmute your mic if you have any questions about the Christian at ease or the verses that I read in the beginning just unmute your mic and let's see what we can do any comments or thoughts Christian at ease. He wants us to be relaxed because of who's on our side. God is on our side. Why can't we be relaxed? The only thing we have to know is what he said so that we can be relaxed. And we just have to know more about his faithfulness and know more about his track record. So it's just like an acquaintance and a best friend. You don't know much about an acquaintance, so you don't know if you can really trust this person, right? But your best friend it was an acquaintance at one point in time. But over the course of time, as you got to know him or her, they became trustworthy, faithful, a good friend, a true friend. And so they now became your best friend. And you can trust this best friend because he or she has proven over time that he or she can be counted on, right? So likewise, if you don't really know much about God, no wonder why it's hard for you to trust him. No wonder why you're always worried. You should never be worried because first of all, he's, he's commanded us be anxious for nothing. So that's non-negotiable. That's a direct command from God himself, from Paul. So we should never be anxious. And if you're anxious, that tells me that you're not familiar with the trustworthiness of God himself. So you just need to anchor your soul in his word as you grow in the word, as you study and show yourself to prove, Romans 12, 2 says, don't be like everybody else, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 2. So the more that you get into Bible doctrine, 
I'm telling you, you're going to be able to notice your peace of mind, your stress levels will tank. You're going to say, oh, this is, God's got this. I don't have to worry about a thing. You do not have to worry about anything. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. Because if you're a child of the Most High, if you're a royal family of God, if you belong to him, if you've been adopted into the family of God, then you have everything that he owns. That belongs to you too. In, in this world, if you get adopted, you sign, when the papers are transferred and the transaction is a done deal, then that child, that adopted individual gets everything that the parents have. I mean, that's part of the deal. You are now, unless there's a stipulation there in advance before they had signed the papers, but everything that the child has now is coming from the parents. So you have been adopted into the family of God. You have everything up there in heaven already. You're in fact, you're seated in the heavenlies right now, positionally, positionally speaking. You have nothing to worry about. I know that some might say, easier said than done, Pastor Freddie. No, it's easy to accept it by faith. That's why we don't walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And if, the, if you have a challenge or difficulty walking by faith, that's normal. That's normal. That just tells me you need to advance a little bit more in your spiritual life. You can get to the point where you can trust him so much so that you don't worry. That's a, that's a spiritual resource that's available to you and me. This is part of Christian at ease. We're not supposed to worry. And that's the beauty of being a believer in Christ. Because our resources are in Christ, positionally in him. I always say, I, use, I prefer to use the word in Christ because that talks of our union with him. That talks about our position in him. Because the average person, any Bible church or Bible study, they talk about you're a Christian. I'm a Christian. I, I, I prefer the word in Christ because that talks about who we're connected to. And it has a much more greater impact when you can expound and elaborate. What does it mean to be in Christ? Anybody can, cults call themselves Christians. I'm a Christian, Jehovah, I'm a Jesus Christ Latter-day Saint. So I don't want to be identified with anybody that is cultic because nowadays you use the word Christian. That's anybody on the street. They wear a, an earring that has a cross. I'm a Christian. Look at, look, at my, look at my jewelry. That's not what a Christian is to me. A Christian is someone who's in Christ. So if you ever listen to specifically how I choose to relay certain truths about who we are, it's always in Christ. Rarely do I use the word Christian. I usually, 99% of the time, use the word the person, the believer in Christ. Why? Because that will provoke people to ask, what do you mean believer in Christ? Oh, you mean a Christian? No, believer in Christ. The word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. So why are we going to use it? You ever thought about that? It's only used three times. But the reason why we use it is because everyone uses it. But if everyone jumps off the bridge, would you jump? Again, that comes from experience and studying. So I don't say that everyone is a sinner because they use the word Christian. No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is if the word is only used three times and in Christ is used the majority of the times, especially in the epistles, uh, Romans on, uh, I prefer, I'm more comfortable with the in Christ, in him phraseology than calling myself a Christian. It doesn't mean it's a sin to say you're a Christian, but if it's only used three times versus in Christ multiple times, then should we not make the shift and call ourselves believers in Christ? And then when someone says, why do you use the word in Christ? Well, because the New Testament primarily talks about those who are in Christ those who are part of the royal priesthood, those who are now a, cho a chosen people by the fact that we're a royal priesthood, those are all people in Christ. So that's my two cents. So there's more, much more I could say, but I want to see if anybody has any thoughts or comments. Just unmute your mic and let's see what you have. While I have my sip of water. Anybody? 
Oh, wow. Everyone's quiet tonight, huh? Did I do a decent job or something? <clears throat> no complaints, nothing? You did a great job. Oh, thank you, Karen. And I did good with the time too. It's 11 o'clock here, so that makes it, makes it eight o'clock your time. Perfect timing. But yeah, yes, Sam, that sounds like yeah. Sam. That you yeah, said? Yeah. I, I love that uh, that adjective you used to describe the, the faith uh, about midway through, but mm -hmm. I but I forgot it. <laughs> so can you can you b rewind and and think of that uh, adjective you used uh, the, the uh, for, for the faith, faith? Was it the faith rest? Uh, at that time, at that time when you said the faith rest, but you described a certain kind of faith. Uh, um, hmm. You got me there. <laughs> uh, anybody <laughs> know what Sam's talking about? I, I may have, have I been speaking in tongues or something? <laughs> adjective of faith, that's, uh, that's uh, superior to any other thing that can be happening. Hmm. That's, uh... Anybody help me out? And you know what I may have said that I didn't know I said? I have, I, sometimes I just keep going and going and going, but... It I could rewind it. You 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 have uh, this recorded, right? Yes, so, I do. I have it recorded. So, so I, I can send to. it. I will upload it on our YouTube channel. And I'm also, by the way, guys, I'm uploading these on YouTube, our YouTube channel. And I'm also uploading the audio. I know some of you would prefer to listen to the audio only rather than drain your phone on a video. So we they will be on our YouTube channel and we'll link it on our we're also working on our church website. So we'll try to put everything on one platform so it'll be easy to access. But since I have all of you here, just know that I will be making those available soon. And I'm uploading them as we go through the lessons. So uh, Sam, I'm sorry, I don't remember the term that I used. Um, I know faith- It just made my ear because I, I had that kind of a day where you know, I wondered. If uh, if I was going to make it through it, and yeah. and that nailed it for me, you know, it, and that's it's indisputable that yeah. that that is that's that's truth. So uh, kudos to you for well, thank you, Sam. Using it for it. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate your tenacity too. You you've always been joining our studies ever Maybe. since we reconnected. Yeah, maybe that was it. Something like tenacious faith. Did you use that term? I think I did. I think I used tenacious. Okay. Yeah. That, so that's what I need to. That's what I need to be about. Yeah. Yeah. That's, thank well, you for that. Sam, you're not alone. Everybody on this study, we all go through the trials and challenges of life. But the beauty of it all is that as a believer in Christ, we just have to recognize big picture that God is there for us. We just have to exercise those promises that he has relayed to us through his word. So as you continue to study with us, with me, each and every week, plus your own studies, you start to acquire and amass all these truths about God so that when you need it, God the Holy Spirit will bring that to remembrance so that it will stabilize your soul at the moment. You don't mm. want you don't want to study the word when you're going through hardship. You don't say, oh my gosh, let me study the Bible and all hell's breaking loose. That's not the time to study. The time to study, when, preferably, okay? Preferably when everything is calm because that's when you can focus and concentrate on the word of God during times of prosperity. That's the time that you hit the Bible there. Get into it when everything is calm and collective so that you can utilize it later on when the going gets tough. You, it's kind of like if you're um, on the SWAT team uh, or the military, you don't study how to use your firearm when the enemy is coming at you. You have to study beforehand so that when they come, you can extract the firearm, shoot and pull the trigger. You don't want to learn how to use it when the enemy is running towards you. You need to prepare in advance. 
you don't study the Bible when everything's going hard for you. More than likely, you're, you're too distracted. You're too emotional. That's not the time to study. That's not the time to open your Bible and say, honey, let's study the Bible together because you're not going to be completely there. To be honest, if I'm going through hardship, that's the last thing I want to do. I'm not going to want to study the Bible. I'm not going to even want to pray. I'm all frazzled. I don't want to do a thing. I just want to go in my room and rest and just confess anything. Lord, you know what? I, I may have said something. I may, may have thought something that was not appropriate. And I confess that to you. And so it was one of those days, Lord, but I thank you that I'm under the grace of God and I could have done a better job, but you know what? Um, Tomorrow's a new day, it's a new beginning. I'm going to make sure that I make up for it in the sense that I'm going to apply better. I'm going to apply myself better when something similar comes. So we all get hit, but I don't want to study the Bible. I don't even want to pray, Sam, when all when difficulties is flying all over the place. When bullets are coming at me, the fiery darts from Satan, that's not the time to say, okay, let's see, what does John 3.16 say? What does Romans 8.28 say? No, that's the last thing I want to do. Not at all. So I just want to tell you the reality and all of you listening, the truth is you don't study the Bible when everything's going hard. You study it when you can, which is why studying in a Bible class church is, should be a high priority because that's the time that you can get it when you are relaxed. But that doesn't mean you don't have the problems of the week. That means that when you come on a Sunday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, by the time next week rolls around, you're going to be able to remember these truths. Faith, rest, faith, rest, faith, faith, rest, tenacious faith. You're going to be able to remember this. God's in my corner. If God be for me, who can be against me? Nobody. So when you're bombarded with Bible doctrine, on a consistent basis, that's what conforms you and transforms you as you take in the living word of God. That's so important. People think that they could study um, tomorrow, next week, when they um, plan for it. But sometimes that's not always the case. Circumstances of life hit. Problems in the home, family, all, all these things hit you. Things that you least expect hit you from the corner, broadside you, following week. And so you, now you're, you're having difficulty staying afloat. What do I do? He said this, she did, said that. He's leaving here, going here, going there. All of a sudden, you didn't expect these things. It's like a flat tire. You're driving, also, boom, tire goes out. You're not expecting that. So now going to your appointment, your, your, um, your interview, you have to delay it. Why? You got a flat tire. So now you're, panic mo you're on panic mode. But using that as an example, I can stop. Lord, you know what? I got a flat tire. Uh, I'm going to call and, and delay my interview. Would you please intervene and let them have a soft, soft heart and let them um, say it's okay. I don't want to lose this opportunity to be interviewed for this company. So instead of falling apart, I'm just now going to default to God. Faith rest, faith rest. Okay, Lord, you said you're going to, I can cast my cares upon you. Am I going to lose this job because of this flat tire? I didn't, I wasn't expecting this. I left early enough and look what happened. Lord, rather than panicking, I know that you, I know that you knew this in eternity past. Thank you for allowing me to trust you amidst this. This is your responsibility now. I'm going to call um, AAA. I'm going to call the company and say, look, I had a flat tire. Would it be possible to uh, change my appointment to this afternoon? I don't want to be late again. So instead of my appointment being at 11, can we just aim for three o'clock? I think by three o'clock, they'll be able to replace this tire, my flat. Is that okay? Lord, go before me. That's how faith rest works. Lord, you knew this in eternity past. This is my job as an opportunity to get a better paying job, but this happened to me. So here I am stressing out, but I'm not going to stress out because you said be anxious for nothing. But human nature is that I am tense. I'm cl clenching my fist. But Lord, I know that this is an opportunity for me to watch you unfold your perfect will. You knew this in eternity past. Are you stalling? Watch this. Are you stalling me from being interviewed with this company? Do you have something else for me? Maybe this is not the job you have for me, but I'm going to do what I think is normal and natural. And I ask that you go before me, call the company. You know what? This is Alfredo Cortez. I had an appointment at 11 for an interview. 
I'm here on the five freeway. I had a flat tire. Is there any way that I can move the appointment to three o'clock this afternoon? Sure, no problem. We'll see you at 3 p.m. Be careful. Lord, okay. So if that's not a delay, if that's not something where you want me to get another job, thank you for allowing me to at least be able to have the appointment at 3 p.m. Now, Lord, if there is something for me other than this company, I pray that you go before my appointment and allow me to see what it is that you have for me when I talk to this interviewee. So if there, that job is not for me, would you please close the door and tell them that I'm not a good fit and let me know that there's something else by just closing the door on this interview. I ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. Stepping out in faith, that's an example of using a bad situation and faith resting. I take a bad situation and trust it into God, cast my cares upon him. I ask him to go before me. Lord, if this is not a part of your will, then um, when I ask for an extended time or 3 p.m., they'll just say no. But if I get the interview, I just ask, Lord, that you would um, close the door today so that I know this is not even the job for me. This is just a good opportunity for me to actually see you work amidst my flat tire. Whatever the case may be, I'm trusting that you are going to cause all things to work together for good because I love you. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Thank you for keeping me safe. The flat tire wound up going to the right side of the freeway. I didn't get hurt. I didn't cause a traffic jam and I'm safe. So Lord, thank you for keeping me safe. That's an example of faith resting in a reality of what could happen to any of you now. Okay. So much for, I just took all your time for questions. Sorry about that. Anybody have any thoughts or comments? Just your, unmute your mic. Pastor Freddie, when uh, you, you, when you guys use the word uh, tenacious, mm -hmm. uh, I believe you use that word when you were on uh, page 11, um, talking about, it says here, first of all, faith rest is a continuous habitual <clears throat> faith. Okay. Which is often called perseverance or patience. And it was in that, that section there that I remember you using that word tenacious. Oh, okay. Very good. Good, good memory, Karen. So I didn't remember. Sometimes I just keep going and going and going. And sometimes words will come out that um, I don't even know I'm saying. So, but thank you for that. I, I did use the word tenacious. That I remember. I just don't remember where. And Sam was quick to notice that word. So if you can use that, Sam, use it. Have tenacious faith because Absolutely. we all need that. Can you Can you point to any uh, particular scripture that I can draw from uh, well, for that, uh, for that uh, impetus? Um, you know, because that's, that's, what it, that's what it takes. You know, you, 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 you study the word and, you know, of course, you know, that's, faith is like a, a body of water that's always there supposed yeah. to be there right but it but it needs to be flowing right it needs right. to be moving yeah and that's what i'm thinking a lot a lot of the time so if can you, you point to any if you look scripture? if you look at james chapter two james chapter two that whole section there talks about faith without works is dead so if you have works mm. meaning you're trusting him that you're continuing to do what you normally do amidst the circumstances, then you're also faith resting because that whole book is about faith married with works. So that we don't stay at home and just say, I'm not gonna work, I'm just gonna trust that you're gonna pay my bills. That's not what he wants us to do. He wants us to be proactive. So as we're going out there, living our lives as unto God, as unto our families, we're going to trust him to work out all the details of life because he loves us. So chapter two of James is heavily loaded with the importance of faith being merged with works. But sometimes that's taken in a lordship context where they will say, if you have faith, but you don't have works, you're really not a Christian. I don't look at it that way. I look at chapter two of James, especially with the examples at the tail end of chapter two, where Abraham offered his son, 
Isaac. And so you have this idea that Abraham was faithful to God. He was obedient to God. He was willing to sacrifice his own son. And so James talks about how he was called a friend of God because he obeyed even to the point where he put his son on the line about to sacrifice him. He obeyed God, even though it didn't make sense. Have you ever been in a situation like that, Sam, where you don't understand what in the world is going on and you're praying, Lord, why are these things happening to me? And so, but God sometimes will ask us to do things that are totally uh, illogical, but God is completely in control. He sometimes will have us do the darndest things to see if we will exercise and step out in faith. So we have to be people of faith. We have to be people and understand that we as a chosen people, meaning the royal priesthood, we have to make our impact now. Our world, our culture is dying. And we're the only ones that can make an impact. Now you're saying, well, there's only how many of us tonight? Um, there's only 18 of us. Is that 18? Let me see. Yeah, 18 of us. We can't really change the world, can we? How many, how many disciples did Jesus have? And he turned the world upside down. Twelve, right? Oh. He had 12. So um, what's that? Page 11. Thank you, Karen, Steve. He had 12. So we have 18 here. All of us, if we make an impact with just one person, we can have um, 24 people saved. We, if we save one person, that's 24. If those 24 save one person, that it just keeps growing exponentially, right? You w, 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 and pretty soon. We're going to have the whole culture converted. It's, it's the act of winning people for Christ. And we are commanded to go and make disciples of all people. So that should be our aim, really. So anybody else have any thoughts or comments before we close out? Thank you for your time. Nobody else? Okay, if nothing, let me see. I have, let me see in the chat box. Ro page 11, Romans 12, 12. Okay, very good. Um, so <clears throat> if nothing else, I want to close in prayer and thank you for your time. We're, we ended at a good time here, only 18 minutes past. So if you think that's hard, I'm at 11, 18. So I'm not complaining. Uh, I always enjoy my time with you all because I believe God is honored when we focus on him. And uh, this is a rare moment for all of us where we can come together and study the word of God. So let's close in prayer and give him praise. Father, thank you as always for loving us and extending grace to us as seen first and foremost through your son, Jesus Christ. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God through him. And so we are honored and grateful for adopting us into your family, thus allowing us to be the royal priesthood. Father, what a privilege it is to be chosen by you to be a part of your plan and to think that you're counting on us to impact our culture, our, uh, the people around us is in some ways daunting to say the least, but then to realize and recognize that we have you on our side. Uh, we're told that if God be for us, who can be against us? There really is nobody, not even the devil himself. And so Father, as we continue to study, would you keep every person on this study safe and healthy? I know that there might be some people who might not be feeling their best. Uh, they might be in some discomfort, some pain, maybe struggling with health, whatever the case may be, Father, would you please um, have your loving hands upon them? You know exactly who they are and keep them stable. Keep them confident in your son, Jesus Christ, as they continue to commit to your word and to your ways. I know that sometimes this is not easy. It may be difficult because of where we are in life, maybe with our jobs, maybe with our responsibilities, 
But Father, we know that nothing is important, nothing is difficult for you. And so, Father, as we continue to study your word and make an impact, I just pray that you would place a wall of fire around each person here. Embrace them with your grace and in your love. Let them sense that you are there and keep them safe and stable at all times as they continue to represent you. Father, I love each person on this study in a very special way. It's amazing how you've allowed each and every one of us to be together. We're not always, we don't always see each other in person because of distance, but we know, Lord, that one day this will be a reality. We will be together one day for all eternity and we'll be able to give each other a high five and say, aren't we glad that we did this for the Lord? So Father, in the meantime, keep everyone safe, myself included, and may you be honored and glorified in all that we say, think, and do. We ask and pray all of these things through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Freddie. Good night, everyone. Bye, Rudy. Hey, okay, thank you, Pastor. Bye, yeah. Winston. Okay, bye, Susanna. Bye, Ruben. Yeah. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Karen. Okay. Good night, bye -bye. everybody. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Papa. Good evening, everyone. Good night.